Women on television have always been defined through their interactions with men. However, the creators of Xena Warrior Princess have managed to break through this cultural paradigm. The character of Xena is a woman without male signifiers. On the contrary, the show most directly revolves around Xena's interpersonal interaction with her traveling companion, Gabrielle. They have come to define each other through their experience together. Xena, Warrior Princess, is one of the few shows in the history of television that has gone an entire episode without having any starring or major supporting male actors. In 2015, after many years of public speculation and fan campaigning, NBC Universal finally ordered a reboot of Xena Warrior Princess. And helming the production alongside the obligatory credits to originals Rob Tappert and Sam Raimi would be writer and executive producer Javier Grillo Markswatch. It is not currently 2015 and the project is no longer in the works, but some friends and I have still chosen to spend our time talking about it as well as pitching a few ideas of our own, even though we have but one life on this good green earth. As always, disclaimer, these are just our dumb opinions. Also, spoilers. When Xena Warrior Princess ended its sixth season run in the year 2001, it left a lot of fans desperate for more. Not just because the series was groundbreaking or the fan base was so passionate that it continued to hold conventions every year, but because of the way it had ended. Namely, with the death of the title character in a two-part finale entitled A Friend in Need. This was a decision that the production team defended as fitting for an ancient Greek hero on the quest for redemption. And the finality of it seemingly satisfied the cast and crew after six exhausting, physically demanding seasons. Still, it's also an ending that, in the years since, Lucy Lawless has stated that she hugely regrets. Instead, many fans prefer the light-hearted Many Happy Returns, or the alternate universe exploring and timeline resetting When Fates Collide as their personal end to the series. On a side note, one of the personal reasons that I dislike A Friend in Need, aside from the unnecessarily brutal nature of Xena's death, is that it just doesn't make much sense to me. According to the plot of the episode, Xena needed to die and die permanently in order to save the trapped souls of several thousand villagers whose deaths she had semi-accidentally caused over a decade before. And you're free to disagree, of course, but I just don't get it. The script could easily have been tweaked to demonstrate that the souls would be released someday anyway when Xena went peacefully in her bed at 70. Wishful thinking aside, the whole point of her redemption arc in the series was that it was only through her actions in life, not the event of her death, that could in any way make up for the damage she had caused as a young warlord. Whole races and tribes of people who don't exist anymore because of Xena. Now she's, 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 she's fighting for redemption, but she knows she doesn't deserve redemption. The only thing, she, and she will never get redemption. The only thing she can do is just do do good now, on a day-to-day -day basis, but she doesn't deserve any mercy. All right, she's paying a debt she can never pay, and she'll always be paying 10 cents on the dollar. Death doesn't fix that. Don't you ever get tired of just writing down what I do? Why don't you create new characters? New images? You mean fiction? Anyway, after the ending of Xena Warrior Princess, it didn't take long for official discussions of a follow-up movie to begin circulating. By 2003, writer Catherine Fugit, who had penned season 6 episode When Fates Collide, was signed on to the project, and Universal had granted a budget of around 50 to 60 million dollars, looking forward to a release within the next few years. This budget would, at the time, have put it in the general financial realm of movies like Kill Bill, Elektra, Hellboy, Reign of Fire, and V for Vendetta. For context, this would have been well under the budget of The Mummy Returns, but triple that of Hong Kong-based Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon. We unfortunately have no existing copies of Catherine Fugit's proposed script for the film, although it was later suggested that she intended for the story to take place in Egypt, where Gabrielle would have successfully completed the necessary resurrection for her and Xena's adventures to continue. Meaning that officially, Canonically, Xena the Warrior Princess would no longer have been dead. 
Fugit is primarily a rom-com writer, known for films like Valentine's Day and New Year's Eve. And there's a great breadth of opinion regarding her episode, When Fates Collide, ranging from calling it a fan favorite to calling it glorified fan fiction. It features a lot of greatest hits style character appearances, but the alternate universe nature of the plot also necessitates that we as audience members never really saw how Fugit would candle them in canon. Regardless, by around the year 2004, Lucy Lawless and Renee O'Connor were both signed on to the film, but in the background, a legal dispute was brewing between Rob Tappert and Universal regarding who owned the official rights to the character. The project slipped into development hell and has been there ever since. Catherine Fugit did make an appearance at several Xena conventions to discuss it, like here in 2010, you know, you know that Rob and I worked out a whole movie. I mean, we have a whole pitch. We went in and sat in rooms and wrote it down and kicked this out, kicked that out, and then he kicked me and I kicked him. And, <laughs> and, and finally, we had, we had a, a, a pretty solid treatment. And here I found footage from 2011 and 2012 where she performed, along with some other cast members, a skit about her attempted pitch to Rob Tappert. Yes, that is Farscape's Claudia Black in Lawless's role for the sketch, and I actually kind of love it. That show and her character were both criminally underrated. At the Xena convention in 2015, Lucy Lawless, Renee O'Connor, and the other cast members even enacted a short play written by Fugit for the fan audience, wherein Xena came back to life and found Gabrielle again. But by this point, both Rob Tappert and Lucy Lawless had already been alluding for years that a reboot was much more likely than a continuation. It appeared that Universal was unlikely to move forward with the project anytime within the next 10 years, and no solid developments were announced until the reins were officially handed over in 2015. Xena. And make someone else the hero for change. Javier Grillo Marks Watch boasts writing and or production credits on multiple series, such as the first and best seasons of Lost on ABC, and the highly acclaimed Dark Crystal Age of Resistance from Netflix. He also worked as a producer for The Hundred on The CW, and wrote the season three episode where protagonist Clark Griffin infamously watched her girlfriend Lexa get killed by a stray bullet. And a lot of the direct blame for this was laid, perhaps unfairly, at the writer's feet. The year of Lex's death was 2016, a decade and a half since Xena Warrior Princess had ended with the death of its own queer leading woman. It was 14 years after Tara was killed by a stray bullet on Buffy the Vampire Slayer, slotting into a century of LGBT plus characters being treated as expendable, as lamentable, or as depraved figures headed for an inescapably tragic end. And as we take a brief look into the history of this antediluvian convention, it's important to remember that we're not comparing numbers, we're comparing percentages. You could take any piece of media facing allegations that it treats characters of a certain demographic as disposable, and create a neat pie chart proving that an equal or greater number of deaths register among your fictional census majority. But the real question is this, how many queer characters existed to begin with? How many had leading, featured, or recurring roles? During the 2015-2016 TV season, 22 lesbian characters that appeared in three episodes or more were killed off. That's 25% of all female deaths on TV and 10% of all deaths on TV. Casualty numbers hardly matter when your casualty rate is 50 to 100%. What percentage of the queer population of that film just got killed. Let's pick a nice easy example. Brokeback Mountain, two gay characters, Enos, Jack. Jack dies, Enos lives, 50% mortality rate, 100%. 50% mortality rate, realistically, 100%. 100%. From 33 to 50%, 50%, 100%, 50% mortality rate. Anyway, this is often referred to as the dead lesbian syndrome or the barrier gaze trope. So if you if you look into the history of queer men characters dying off on television, it goes back to even the 70s. Otto Stradle actually has a pretty comprehensive list of queer female deaths on TV. One of the first deaths listed comes from the show Executive Suite from 1976, where the character Julie died. 
Her love interest had just walked into traffic after realizing her lesbianism and Julie was chasing her. Autostraddle currently lists 152 queer deaths since that moment. The website doesthedogdie.com's list does an LGBT person die has too many examples to count. Since Philadelphia um, in 2013, there had been 257 Academy Award nominated portrayals of heterosexual characters and 23 of gay, bisexual or transsexual characters. Of the heterosexual characters, 16.5% die. Of the queer characters, 56.5% die. Over half of the characters die. He then goes on to say, of the 10 LGBT characters who live, only four get happy endings. Four characters in 19 years. The same week as Lexa, a character on The Magicians was introduced as a gay woman of color and then killed herself basically two scenes later. Also that week, there was Denise on The Walking Dead got an arrow in the eye when in the comics that happened to a white guy. On The Vampire Diaries, a gay witch couple decided to kill themselves together rather than one of them just dying, so both of them died. On Empire, Camilla killed her wife, Mimi, with poison and then was killed herself. Suffice to say we can trace many of these issues directly back to the early 1900s moral panic and censorship, culminating in the Hayes Code, a set of supposed moral guidelines which ruled the motion picture industry from 1934 to 1968 and did not allow for the portrayal of any supposedly immoral act without the application of appropriate punishment by the film's end. Movies were not protected by the First Amendment guarantee of free speech. Due to this ruling, harsh censorship legislation was eventually enacted in the states of New York, Florida, Massachusetts, Maryland, and Virginia within just a few years following the judgment. The gold standard in the United States was in the New York statute passed in 1921. It stated that a film should be licensed by the state unless such a film or part thereof is of such character that its exhibition would tend to corrupt morals or incite crime. By 1922, there were censorship bills before the legislature of 32 states showing things like sex, homosexuality, interracial relationships, and other such things was fine as long as the participants were punished. This made way for a flood of coded queer characters, either portrayed as tragic victims or as villains swiftly punished punished by death. These laws also forbade disrespect of authority figures, villainous portrayals of the clergy, and favorable views of sex outside of marriage. Fast forward to today, and the TV Tropes page on the Bury Your Gaze phenomenon has over a hundred entries. Happily, portrayals of queer love on screen have only grown more numerous and more nuanced, leading to discussions about whether intelligent, sensitive writing can allow certain on-screen queer deaths to transcend or even subvert the trope. Yorkie and Kelly on Black Mirror, as well as Bill and Frank in The Last of Us, live long, beautiful, triumphant lives together from a certain point of view. Or flipping to a completely different perspective, how do you classify the death of someone like Oberyn Martell on a show like Game of Thrones, which notoriously kills off its leading characters? Either way, successfully transcending this trope certainly seemed to be the unfulfilled hope of the writers and producers on the Hundred. But instead, the episode, alongside the concurrent deaths of lesbian characters on other shows like Jane the Virgin and The Walking Dead, kickstarted a fury across the entire internet. And therefore, when it was announced the very next year that one of the writers involved would be helming the new Xena Warrior Princess reboot, which to reiterate had ended its own run in Xena's controversial death nearly a decade and a half prior, fans as I'm sure you can imagine, fucking lost it. The thing is, it's important to note that any decision to kill off a major character does not always come down to the writer for that individual episode. These are often top-down decisions, and showrunner Jason Rothenberg, three weeks after the episode first aired, said in an open letter, quote, knowing everything I know now, Lexa's death would have played out differently. But despite this, it was the screenwriter for the episode who took the majority of the heat, some of which included unnecessary personal attacks, like it shouldn't have to be said in the year of our Lord 2023, but don't send people death threats. We don't condone personal attacks against members of production, and neither should you. But in a later series of interviews and posts on his personal Tumblr page, he addressed the controversy a number of times. Quote, 
It was a really unfortunate confluence of creative decisions that had the wrong and most unintended impact and could have been avoided, but weren't. He would also elaborate, my wife was actually producing a web series about the lives of trans and queer women in Los Angeles during the time I was writing on The 100. And I'm a friend of Amber Benson, and you know, she's Tara. She's the original shot by a stray bullet girl. It's not as if I was not aware of the pitfalls of where we were going. You hope and pray that you can give a voice to the story that your showrunner wants to tell in a way that isn't going to be injurious. And what you're ultimately seeing is that a group of people who had the best narrative intentions created an outcome that sadly hurt a lot of people. And for me personally, my response to this was to engage fully and to listen actively and to commit in a way that was respectful to the anger that was being expressed. As a member of a minority group himself, he understood the anger, he had hope for better handling of such issues in the future, that he couldn't apologize for what had been written without feeling that he was betraying the production and writing team, but that he also recognized his own social privilege, even within his minority status, as well as the power of his position in the industry, and that he was listening to fans about their opinions and experiences. So did he seem compassionate, well-intentioned, as though he was taking the issue seriously and deserved the benefit of the doubt from fans? Yeah, I think so. This fiction stuff can be really funny. The new showrunner had a lot to say going into the pre-production phase of the reboot. When he heard that NBC was looking to do a reboot, he immediately asked his agents to get him in the room. In fact, he saw it as an opportunity to apologize for his role, active or not, in the death of Lex's character. After the last official Xena convention, he even got in touch with a group of fans holding a retreat near LA, went out with them for a drink, and spent hours chatting about the show and its impact on their lives. He later claimed that the experience really helped him in writing the script for the reboot, and in focusing on what was important to people about the franchise. He even promised that under his hand, Xena's relationship with Gabrielle wouldn't be subtext, but it would be main text. Quote, there's no reason to bring Xena back if it's not there for the purpose of fully exploring a relationship that could only be shown subtextually in the first run syndication in the 1990s. And as for the tragic ending, I am still working on the beginning of this story. I'm not sure how or where it will take us, but frankly, I think that if they should die, old age is the way to go. Then in an interview with Gizmodo, a great deal of the appeal of the show lies in certain pulpy elements, like Gabrielle's bare midriff, Xena's leather miniskirt, and it's hard for me in a post Brienne of Tarth era to reconcile with the idea that Xena and her friends can meet every challenge in such skimpy outfits. I think we're going to have some very lengthy discussions about how to bring those elements into the present day without missing the beat on what makes Xena exactly what she is. I've talked at length about my many varied opinions on Xena's costume, mostly that the corseting and low cut should be updated for comfort, but that her outfit otherwise is the same general shape and coverage as that of an ancient Greek hoplite, sans helmet and shield, and that the show was actually strides ahead for putting her in flat, sporty running shoes and building a comfortable boot with knee pads around them. But nobody needs to be fighting evil in a bikini, and extra protective garb for actresses and stunt women is something I will always advocate for. You know, women stunt performers have to deal with the fact that their characters oftentimes are showing more skin, are wearing tighter costumes, and you can't deal with pads as mm -hmm. easily. So you're just going out there, you're taking these hits with nothing to protect you compared mm -hmm. to, you know, a guy shows up and he's got his full armor kit on, you know? Has that awareness shaped costumes or character design at all in this, like, day and age? Or do you find that you're still doing just as many stunts having to be like, well, tank top and shorts, let's go? Yes. For, to put elbow pads and knee pads on me, I had to wear baseball baseball knee pads or elbow pads, and they're bulky and they're big. And a lot of times, especially being a girl, I couldn't wear them because I'd put them on and they'd show through the costume. So I'd take them off and we'd do these stunts without any pads on only because you see them. So this could only be a net gain. Besides, according to the same interview, certain elements wouldn't change. Quote, 
There are a few things that are sacrosanct, the chakram and the quarterstaff, of course, Gabrielle's ambition to become a bard, and, most importantly, that Zina and Gabrielle be soulmates. All in all, I think this information left fans feeling a lot more hopeful about the project. Where's Zina? Who are those? What are you? Wait a minute. When in 2017 it was announced that the showrunner and the network had parted ways due to insurmountable creative differences, the news was met with general disappointment. And while rumors swirled, it was made clear that disagreements over the Xena Gabrielle relationship had not contributed to the reboot's demise. NBC Entertainment president Jennifer Salke, interviewed in the same year, said, We looked at some material. We decided at that point that it didn't warrant the reboot. I'll never say never on this one because it's such a beloved title, but its current incarnation is dead. Just like Xena. Whoa. Whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. Are you saying anything you write in there comes true? Excuse me while I laugh. <laughs> oh, ah! All right. So. I want to preface this by saying that the writer seems like a very nice man with nothing but the best of intention, and I wish him well, both in his personal and his professional life. It's also important to understand and acknowledge that it's rarely a cut and dry affair to separate which elements of a script were mandated by studio involvement and which were wholesale the creation of the screenwriter or some other unnamed creatives potentially involved behind the scenes. I'll also be making a genuine effort to separate my emotions regarding the concept of a story element being different from the original and the concept of a story element that I inherently disagree with. So, here's the proposed rundown of season one. Content warning for discussion of sexual assault and child abuse. The vibe of the reboot would have been somewhere between Gladiator and Mad Max Fury Road. The tone would have less slapstick action comedy and instead present action scenes that were, quote, pretty harrowing. Why? <laughs> I'm sorry, was it too early? Keep going. <laughs> I, I think I think they want to like, this was, you know, this was like the mid 2010s. Game of Thrones was big. Like Spartacus was out. Um, yeah, I was there. I remember. <laughs> Um, and I mean, Mad Max Fury Road had just come out and was being hailed as like this great feminist action movie, which it was. Right. But Mad Max, like as a franchise, is very different than Xena. If there was humor, it would come from the dynamic between the two leads. Gabrielle is plucky and verbose. Xena as the straight man with no sense of humor. Xena was fucking funny, but like... But it started out like, if I think episode one, she's much more monotone. Under the assumption that the original series had largely embraced camp out of necessity due to the lack of budget, the new show would live in a more grounded world where the stakes felt high and the threat of violence was very real. Um, I mean, season one, Xena had the budget of a 16 millimeter camera, one of them. <laughs> <laughs> but like... It being made in New Zealand, there's a certain type of New Zealand camp that I feel like you can see in some of Taika Waititi's work, like um, Our Flag Means Death and stuff like that. Instead of a naive farm girl, Gabrielle would begin the series as part of the nomadic Scythian tribe, because Scythians supposedly had a more liberal attitude towards women and a greater propensity for producing female warriors. Despite this, Gabrielle would still be a callow youth with dreams of being a bard. I will say, like, the Scythians were really cool. They're part of one of the cultures that, you know, like, our modern image of the Amazons was potentially based on. Um, right, their right. original, like, sort they of... Were, they were horse fairy, Western right? Western Asian. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. nomadic horseback warriors that I think immigrated from, like, somewhere in the Middle East, like, Iran to, like, Western Russia. Sure, but the entire... Gabrielle's entire arc <laughs> is defying her cultural norms yeah and doing what like growing and doing something different and, and her conflict with that as well she leaves with Zena because she doesn't belong at home and she feels like she doesn't belong at home i don't i don't dislike the Scythian thing inherently i i think the Scythian thing is like potentially cool depending what they do with it it's potentially cool for someone who's not gabrielle <laughs> <laughs> 
it would be much less naive farm girl runs away with like girlfriend in a leather jacket who runs a biker gang, which was kind of the vibe of the OG. Like whenever Zena and Bro like came back home with Gabrielle, the way her yeah. parents treated her. Because it, it very much just parallels like kid goes to college, finds out they're queer. Yeah. It's girlfriend. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's interesting. I always thought the Scythians were real cool. I did book reports on them as a kid. I mean, they're extremely cool. Zena was to be an orphan who had been sold into slavery in childhood, fought her way out of servitude, and became a warlord. She views the world as a horrible pit of violence and betrayal, and she has no faith in humanity. So I, I understand a Zena that has no faith in humanity. Sure. I, I get that. Yeah. I'm I'm not sure where to start because the thing is once I start I'm not going to stop. Well then you don't want me to start either because I'll just I'm sure that creating this new backstory for Zena where she was a young slave in a world of high stakes and real violence with real consequences didn't in any way intend to imply that she had experienced sexual violence in childhood. I want to truly, to like, truly reiterate that, that I'm not trying to put words in anyone's mouth here. As we discussed previously, it was specifically mentioned that Gladiator was a big tonal inspiration for the reboot. Um, and that very much involves a male character who's pushed into gladiatorial slavery and tries to fight his way to a certain type of freedom. Um, there's also Spartacus as a connection there. And my assumption here is that this is an attempt at an almost gender neutral backstory for Xena following in the footsteps of Maximus and Spartacus and the classic story of a slave who physically fights their way out of oppression. It's also worth mentioning that in ancient times, sexual abuse of slaves was not limited to any one gender. Um, but what I am saying is that if one is not careful, Writing a character as a young female slave within a purposely more realistic, more grounded world where the threat of violence is intended to feel real and present because of certain social structures that have been present throughout history, because of the assumptions that a modern audience is likely to make on hearing that information, and also because of the purposeful tonal references to Mad Max Fury Road, which uses sexual assault and sexual slavery as backstory for the majority of its female characters, a portion of the viewership would read any mention of a female character in slavery as implication that that character could have experienced sexual violence in childhood. The sexual assault mm. in Mad Max Fury Road was a core component of that story. Yeah. It, it was the purpose of that story, was women's agency and the removal of it, and, and what it means to get that back in a society that doesn't view it as being something that exists, right? Yeah. Um, Xena's story is not about that. Yeah. That's not why I'm watching Xena. I'm watching Xena because I want to watch her catch fish with her bare hands and beat some guy up with, like, a chakram that defies physics. Yeah. Very, very different <laughs> things that I'm looking for out of these stories. And this isn't to say Mad Max Fury Road was not a phenomenal oh, movie. Oh, it's incredible. It was great. Yeah. It was an incredible movie. Thematically very different yeah. from Xena. It, it's worth noting that, like, okay... Being possessed of great martial skill and, like, supreme physical strength, right? In all cases, that's not necessarily un unassailable defense against unwanted acts of sexual aggression. But right. one of the reasons that assault wasn't overly present in Xena Warrior Princess is that she could just rip a man's head from their neck like she was plucking a berry. And yep. there was something incredibly refreshing about that. Like, there are a few times on the show where people tried something on with her. Like, when a guy was being sleazy in a bar, and she punted them into the sun. There's no reason why we can't be adults about this and have a little fun. Are you suicidal? I got just what you need. And plenty of it, too. <laughs> and the extreme catharsis. Just the relief of knowing that, like, she could walk into dark alleys that you couldn't. Yeah. Fucking magical. Like, how many waitresses that worked at Greasy Spoons do you think just tuned into Z and was like, God, I wish I could do that to my customers? God, yeah. The, the idea of Zena 
in my opinion, right, is that um, women already live in a reality where there is the threat of sexual assault, right? The power fantasy of Xena is that that's never really a fear that's shown on screen. It's sometimes implied to be a threat. Like, episode one, right? Yeah. That they're rounding up the women. Yeah. Gabrielle's little little village of women who are doing the washing. We know what their intention is. Yeah. But it's not said. And it never happens. Xena comes in and she saves the day. Yeah. Modern storytelling seems to think that a feminist power fantasy is surviving sexual assault. When the actual power fantasy is never having to worry about it at all. The actual power fantasy is being six feet tall with the power to kill the gods. You might, like, look at Xena and go, okay, this is unrealistic. Yeah. Which, what? <laughs> How could that be true? <laughs> um, sometimes people need a little bit of unrealism. Yeah. It's about living in a world where you can just hike cross country alone with your bestie and sleep under the stars and you're never under threat from the type of thing that would plague you in real life. Who hasn't wanted that? One of the earliest big screen female-led superhero movies ever made, right, was 1985's Red Sonja, which is about a woman who... um after rejecting an evil queen's advances, is assaulted and left for dead by a group of the queen's soldiers before being, um, she was like granted powerful combat skills by a nameless spirit in answer to her cry for revenge. One of the most recent big screen female-led superhero movies was 2021's Black Widow which follows a number of women who were raised from childhood in a brutal all-female elite spy program that included combat, seduction training, a forced hysterectomy, and probably a fair amount of assault. That's nearly 40 years of history. Yep. And um, the rape and revenge and rape as backstory pages on TV tropes have hundreds of entries. I've seen these general themes threaded into the stories of tough women on screen in The Last Kingdom and Outlander and Peaky Blinders and Spartacus and Gladiator and 300 Rise of an Empire and Tech Girl and The Witcher and Vikings and Westworld and The Boys. And it's not just schlock and nice spit on your grave one through five. It's prestige films and television shows Films and shows with characters that I love and actively watch. It's Game of Thrones. It's Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. It's Mad Max Fury Road. It's Jessica Jones. It's The Killing Joke. It's some of the most iconic female action stories of our lifetime. It's in Foxy Brown. It's in Kill Bill. It nearly fucking happens to Ripley in Alien 3. And in Terminator 2, one of the orderlies licks Sarah Connor's face while she appears to be catatonic. Even when it's not explicit, the threat and implication of it still remains in so many of these properties. There's a sequence in Battlestar Galactica that actress Katie Sackhoff, she said it was written like a rape scene. There's whatever the fuck is going on with Princess Leia's golden bikini in Return of the Jedi when she is Jabba the Hutt's slave girl. In the early 1990s, Mark Millar um, wrote a 22-page comic book script called The Rape of Wonder Woman and pitched it to DC as a joke, he says. But DC apparently actually considered publishing it. So sexual assault written, you know, in some cases, delicately and meaningfully or otherwise. It is a part of some male characters backstory, even beyond the situations where it's played for laughs. Like I mentioned Outlander before, and there's a lot of issues surrounding the serious treatment of Jamie Fraser's assault. Uh... Just percentage-wise on screen, though, assault overwhelmingly is a part of women's stories. You can write a Thermian argument. You can push the merits of portraying the worst depths of human depravity, like, on screen, or insist that, like, its inclusion is realistic in a world where you have a thousand other things that aren't realistic. But I'm overseeing it included in stories where it's not necessary. So 
I hope when including this like child slavery element in the reboot, the production would have taken extra care to make it very clear to the audience that this wasn't their intended implication. Like the discussion is why is there this continued focus on sexual assault in in media from from male filmmakers? I think this whole discussion naturally engenders a sort of like a very complicated conversation about what is empowerment? What is a piece that promotes equality for a marginalized group? And inevitably there's two schools of thought. And I think these two schools should and do coexist. And they are one, show an unflinchingly realistic take on extreme suffering in order to promote awareness and evoke sympathy. Or two, <laughs> create a fictional environment of strength and empowerment and joy where the character's struggles lie elsewhere in other issues. When you look at the media landscape, there is this morbid fascination with creating pieces that really highlight and focus on the travesty of the human experience, where humans are horrible to other humans. Enter Trauma Olympics. And these are the pieces that are often considered critically acclaimed. Now, part of this is that car crash phenomenon where you're driving on the highway, you see a car crash, God forbid, and it's fiery and it's chaotic and you just cannot look away. But the other side is this more voyeuristic thing where we're watching the brutality up close and it's happening to others, so it's much easier than experiencing it for ourselves. Do I think that tragedy should never be captured on film? Maybe. Not completely. I'm not of the mind that it should be completely cut off. Because I do think these films and movies are super important and have illuminated things that we were otherwise unaware of. The rape revenge genre is paradoxically sandwiched between two opposing opinions of being either seen as a misogynistic, sadistic male gaze device, or a proto-feminist reclamation of power considering how social structures do not protect survivors. Rape revenge films are too broad and ranging in quality for there to be one fair statement in any definitive way. Not to mention which one of these statements feels true depends on the viewer and the relationship the viewer has to the subject matter. For some survivors, the violence can be cathartic. For others, having to see a real rape portrayed on film triggers terrible memories, and both of those feelings are valid and important in this dialogue. For me as a survivor, rape revenge is often an opportunity to put a rage so often left unsung onto the camera. Of course, then we have to examine who is behind the camera, who is writing the stories, and who gets to have revenge. Everybody's gonna feel different about it, and however you feel about it is completely valid. Much of the double or genre has been critiqued by feminists and feminist film critics for their exploitation of women's pain and suffering. I'm more interested with the modern feminist engagement with the genre and the attempts to shift it from exploitative to representative of the experiences of SA victims. The shift is visible in front of as well as behind the camera with more women writing and directing films and drawing from their own experiences. Sadly, films about racism, queer longing, and being a tragic marginalized person is like butter on a roll to cinema. And because of that, independent films about black joy, comedies, and romances are just not always on the radar of a lot of people. Pain gets a reaction. Tapping into a collective trauma gets a reaction. And with that, promotion, marketing, and a name for yourself. Sometimes to make Creed and Black Panther, you have to also make Fruitville Station. There was a severe lack of happy, light-hearted stories where queer people got to be openly and unapologetically themselves. Stories where children and teenagers like me could see that this lifestyle didn't have to lead to misery, isolation, and death. As the world evolves, I too wonder if this does any damage to the queer youth coming up. I wonder if they somehow accept these tragic depictions as their fate because they see it so often in media. There absolutely is truth in queer pain, and like Rowan said, it's incredibly beneficial for those who have been through similar circumstances to feel seen and have someone to relate to. And for those of us who can't relate, seeing others in pain that we've never experienced can be a very effective medium of empathy. We all need some positivity in our lives, and if I'm being honest, most of the gay movies I've seen are quite sad and mostly negative. 
There are so many sad ones in fact that I actually had a bit of trouble finding 10 movies that are positive and have happy endings. So, so, so often, queerness is depicted as this thing that some people are burdened with an obstacle that they have to work through or overcome or learn how to deal with in order to live fulfilling lives. Too often, we dwell on the negatives of history's LGBTQ plus artists, dark stories, pain and repression. We have like Keith Haring, who sadly died of, of AIDS, Basquiat, who died of drug abuse. It's not just in the visual arts, but across different art forms. But look closer and queer joy can be found, sometimes explicit, but sometimes in the abstract. So how do we identify when writers are genuinely telling our stories versus exploiting them or sensationalizing them to appeal to the cisgender heterosexual gaze? Again, I think we need both. There is room for Jessica Jones, which told a very powerful story about assault and surviving assault and PTSD. Or something like I May Destroy You with uh, Michaela Cole wrote that about her own experiences. Um, right. And that can and should exist in a world with like Wonder Woman and Xena or going on right. to like other topics and for, for other groups. Like It's a Sin, which talks about um, the AIDS crisis, can and should coexist with Our Flag Means Death. Paris is burning and Queer Eye and Heartstopper. Like these things all should be really important. Jessica Jones was a really important show, but Xena isn't that. Right. Like, like Z Xena shouldn't be Handmaid's Tale. No, exactly. Xena shouldn't be Game of Thrones. Yeah. But Xena was so much larger than life, so much more powerful. Episodes where the violence became graphic or felt particularly gendered were very rare. To the point where they did happen, if they did happen, they really stuck out. The other thing is, she would have been an orphan in this. How do you feel about mm -hmm. that? Terrible. Yeah. Um, huge part of Zena's story is, is that you can never go home. Yes. Right. That's, in fact, the one of the first things she's told yep. in that episode yeah. um, by Draco, I believe. Yeah. Where he's like, you can't go home again. You just can't do it. Yeah. Like, you're going to be a monster. You can't do it. Yeah. She goes home, and you know what? She was a monster. They threw rocks at her. They threw rocks at her. Her own mother threatens her at sword point. Yeah. And that's that's a huge part of Zena's story. Yeah. Where she did what she thought was right. There were tragic outcomes to that. She leaves because, you know, she, uh, she got her brother killed. And um, her mom probably can't even look at her anymore. Yeah. And... She goes and she makes a series of terrible decisions because she's like 16. Yeah. And she makes progressively more serious bad decisions. Yeah. And her name spreads across the entire fucking <laughs> empire. And everyone, everyone knows who she is. And um, as an evil murdering harlot. As an evil murdering harlot. And um, you can never go home. Yeah. Her mom being ashamed of her. And afraid of her. You actually get a really interesting, like, mother-daughter dynamic, which doesn't happen yeah. really all that often, right? There's something that's always been really rare and unique about Zima's, Zina's backstory in that while she was born into a violent world, and violence obviously impacted her life, choosing a life of violence was something she did of her own free will. This could evil, easily have been like the story of a man whose village was under threat, decided to fight back, saw some of his family killed, and ended up on a slippery slope to turning warlord. That was basically the plot of that movie, The Northman, the Robert Eggers film. She chose to pick up that sword because she's the kind of person who always will. Because she is not a person who will sit there and do nothing when there's potential action to be taken. And because, like, and here's like the really rare part in a female hero especially, she kind of likes the violence. The thing about Xena is that every decision she's made, she has made. And sometimes she has good motivations and sometimes she has bad motivations. But it's about it's about the agency. It's about the agency. You can't just remove the agency from a feminist story. It's like removing the stuffing from an Oreo and then calling it an Oreo. <laughs> like, no, he just gave me chocolate biscuits. Sina had been a solo warlord in the past, but now she was operating as a second in command. 
I have two questions. Okay. Is Hercules a warlord? Yeah, he's a bad dude in this. Why? <laughs> so, like, I, I think, you know, if you look at the original Legends, he was Yeah, I know he was a prick. Sure, yeah. I, I think this is, again, framing a feminist narrative as being a woman escaping male subjugation. But why was she under male subjugation to begin with? I mean, I'm trying to look back on the series. Did she ever operate as second in command to anyone ever? Because the only thing that comes to mind is when she was warlording with Boreas. And they had a very mutual toxic relationship. But she was um, extremely injured at the time. And then later pregnant. Yeah, 19 or 20. Like, she's... It's 10 years, 9 to 10 years prior to the start of her solo series. She's very young. I know she was a Valkyrie for a little while. Did that mean that she was... I guess somebody was in command of her then? I think she was part of a group then. But that didn't go well. Anytime Zena's not in command, she tends to murder everyone involved. Yeah, because she wants to be. The, that, the thing with Xena, actually, which is, is something that you don't often get with women, is that she's power hungry. She is continuously power hungry. Something she fights herself on in, the new, in her standalone series. You put her in charge of an army and she starts going down that path again because she likes it. Because she likes it. Because there's an old essay with a quote I really like, and it talks about how Xena was so rare in the 90s because she wasn't defined by her relationship with men. And in her own safe self-titled show, like especially, like that's broadly true. Um, what they're say- showing here, there's an opportunity to start the show, season one, episode one, without starting her off focused on her interpersonal relationship with a man. Yeah. I mean, the most recurring male character in Xena is... Joxer. Joxer. <laughs> yeah. To avoid the hated concept of Xena having been turned good due to Hercules' sweet loving... She would instead begin the series working alongside and in a sexual relationship with a villainous Hercules. How is that better? Because I think it's trying to show that like her decision, her major life decision in being not evil anymore is not as influenced by... Um, Although like it wasn't entirely in the original either. Like she lost her army and went through the gauntlet because she drew the line at killing a baby. And he he just showed her... Yeah, Hercules gave her the the space she needed to make the decision. Yeah, yeah. He didn't make the decision. Hercules gave her, like, a sounding board. She was never like, ooh, yes, I'm morally pure. Yeah. She was like, uh, yeah, I'm going to fuck around, and one day I'm going to find out. Yeah. And then she found out, and then she found out, and then she found yeah. out. And then she was like, eventually, like, maybe if I just stopped fucking around, I would stop finding out. If you put violence almost in the frame of addiction, he's almost more like her Mm -hmm. sponsor, where you have to make the decision for yourself, but sometimes you need someone to show you a good way to keep on the straight and narrow. He would be completing his mythical 12 labors, and while she was actually responsible for most of them, he was taking the credit. Hercules would now be closer to the Hercules of myth, an asshole. But in the pilot episode, Hercules betrays Xena, puts her through the gauntlet, takes their army and leaves her for dead without watching it i don't know how much like trust she had in hercules to begin with if she was like surprised by this or if she was expecting it gabrielle finds and nurses xena back to health all the while having no idea who xena really is in return xena trains gabrielle initially pretending altruistic motivations while using the opportunity to get herself back into fighting shape Gabrielle wants to become a bard, and Xena just wants to murder Hercules in revenge. Then we meet the Scythian king, who claims that Gabrielle is the exact spitting image of his daughter, the princess. Mm. Doppelgangers and arranged marriage plots is very OG Xena. Um, That's fun. Uh, Though I I find the note about revenge so interesting, because you'd think Xena would be the type to really want to get revenge on someone who'd screwed her over, but historically in the series it hasn't always happened has it she never kept going after Cortes like her brother did she never really tried to go after Caesar I mean maybe she thought he was untouchable but uh, she kind of just went off rampaging instead didn't she I guess she did kill Darfus so maybe that tracks he decides to marry Gabrielle off to the leader of a rival tribe in order to create an alliance against a massive enemy army currently laying siege to the Scythian capital. 
as far as all the plot points you've described to me, this is the funniest of them. Yeah. Zena and Gabrielle part ways until Zena discovers that the rampaging evil army is actually led by Hercules. Hercules sacks the Scythian capital, murders its inhabitants, and takes Gabrielle as a hostage. This storyline would be one example of how the Xena reboot intended to take tropes from the original and play out their more realistic consequences. At the Scythian king's behest, Xena rounds up some soldiers and chases after Hercules' army. This mission to rescue Gabrielle would end up turning her from evil to good and function as her first step towards redemption. Okay, so, so all right, but Hercules has kidnapped Gabrielle. <laughs> Weird fucking <laughs> sentence. We we could we could also argue that this is her still being changed by Hercules, sweet loving. She just decided that it wasn't good enough. <laughs> it would take about three episodes to reunite Zena and Gabrielle, at which point Gabrielle would be a bit brainwashed, and it would take another couple of episodes to acquire the services of a healer. In other words, it would take true time and effort to get Gabrielle to a place where she was really Gabrielle again. Brainwashed? By what? Like, ye olde... <laughs> like, Maybe they mean, like, like uh, Stockholm Syndrome or, like, she's traumatized from her experiences. So they're not gallivanting across the countryside having fun adventures together. <laughs> Overall, the format of the series would be less episodic and instead focus more on long-form storytelling. Zena's quest to save Gabrielle would take up a good portion of the first season. The world would be realistic instead of campy, grounded instead of magical, and more feminist than the male gazy original. The phrase more anti-male was also used. Um, I need to look something up really quick. Hold on one second. I'm just looking up the dictionary definition of feminism to make sure I wasn't wrong. Returning characters may have included Callisto on the warpath, as well as Joxer and Autolycus as old soldiers who had once worked with Xena. Autolycus is an old soldier? Um, okay, here's a good part. Xena and Gabrielle would fall in love in main text, not subtext, and neither of them would die an untimely death. Great, I support that. Quote, If this were a television show about a dude... The story would be about how this knight errant winds up going after a princess and rescuing her, and they fall in love. There was a time when I actually had seen a kiss Gabrielle at the end of the pilot, when she tries to rescue her before Hercules takes her away. Or Gabrielle kisses Zena because Zena has made her first real selfless gesture by coming back to rescue her. And the note I received was, well, that needs to be earned. And my note back was, hey, if this were a show about a dude, it would be considered earned by now. I feel like this is a really good case of, like, he's a little confused, but he's got the spirit. The issue is that it shouldn't be earned on the first episode for any any gender, <laughs> you know? But, like, you got the spirit, and I appreciate it. Yeah. Hey, man, good for you. Once NBC had ultimately turned down the project, there were also brief discussions about the possibility of taking the reboot to a different platform. Rather than Gladiator vs. Mad Max, it would have been more akin to Star Wars The Force Awakens. The story would include more supernatural elements and likely feature Xena fighting Jason and the Argonauts, who had recruited a villainous Hercules to their team. That sounds like fun, actually. Not every adaption needs to be exactly like the original, and in fact, some of the best ones have been those that took creative liberty and just decided to make a good story rather than necessarily worshipping the elements of the universe that they were pulled from. But I don't think it's overstating it to say that fan reaction would likely have been mixed. And anyway, in the autumn of 2018, the script for the proposed pilot episode of the Scrapped Reboot would finally be leaked online. Why'd I do that? Because I wrote you did. I can write anything. And, and it comes true. My only comment before moving on to the live script reading is to remind viewers that all opinions to follow are, again, highly subjective. Also, again, warning for blunt discussion of sexual assault and child abuse. Xena, Destroyer of Nations, pilot episode. We open on a group of soldiers in the Thracian countryside at night. 
The soldier's leader is a symbol of strength and virility. He's cunning and brutally handsome. It's Hercules. Wait, this is Hercules? I thought they were going to be talking about like Ares or something. How is Hercules supposed to be cunning and brutally handsome? He's boring. <laughs> <laughs> I skimmed right over the Nemean lion part. I, that should have been my clue. And also his scampering nephew, Aeolus. Wait a second, his sidekick is his nephew? In legend, in the original myth, I believe Aeolus was his nephew. The script. Is this is for Hercules, not Xena? No, this is for Xena. Okay, I just wanted to clarify, okay. They're outside the castle keep of a giant and his evil flesh-eating horses, which the king of Argos has sent Hercules and his men to steal. And Hercules goes, This is how our liege wants us to taunt his enemies. And then we will be his hand, as long as his gold lasts. Hercules is a mercenary? Yeah. Well, I don't know. In the original legend, he wasn't a super good guy. Then a commanding female voice breaks in. Yeah! Why not just sneak in and take the horses? Xena is wearing black armor, and her face is slashed with war paint. She's every bit as capable as the men, and she's smarter, she's imposing, and she's ambitious. Hercules says, This is not a smash-and-grab job, Xena. The mares of Diomedes are feral. And Xena counters, But with your plan, we'll awaken the entire compound before the prize is in our hands. Hercules shoots Xena a shut-down glare, and she stops talking. When is this supposed to be happening? Like, why would she give a shit about what he says? No one says, oh, did you watch Hercules back? No, they say, Xena turned me gay. He's here because he was instrumental in her original introduction, right? Yeah. It was her introduction in the episodes of Hercules. She was a villain, and he was the hero. So this is the way the series starts this time. I, I don't know. Then Hercules proceeds to make plans and dish them out to his men. But Xena is gone. Smash cut to her running through the woods to the castle, soundless as a gazelle. How about she's a panther? Why is she a gazelle? I do love a smash cut, though. I can't object to that. A gazelle. <laughs> do you think a gazelle is too, um... Prey-shaped? Yes. Oh, yeah, I didn't think about that. Well, I'm glad we haven't started out nitpicking. Xena uses her momentum to grab onto a low-hanging tree branch and climb into the canopy. So it sounds like we're not doing the crazy kicks and flips on wire that the original series was doing, but we're still doing some slightly like heightened realism in terms of like extreme agility and things like that. She kills a couple of castle sentries, the second one with her chakram. Hercules watches from afar, telling his men to hold fast. There is silence until the barn windows light up with flames. And Hercules shouts, Zeus is Zeus balls! Is <laughs> Isn't like, um, isn't Zeus Hercules' dad? Yeah. Ooh! <laughs> That's another level of awkward. <laughs> Keep reading! The stable gates bust open and Xena sits atop a screaming warhorse, pulling the others behind her while emitting her signature Xena war cry. Hercules and his men engage the palace guards. Xena tosses over the bundle of lines holding the screaming war horses with all the attitude of a rapper's mic drop. Okay. Oh no. The giant busts through the castle door, seven feet tall and wielding a battle axe. He and Hercules engage, but a distraction gives Diomedes just enough of an opening to pummel him in the ribs. As Diomedes lifts his axe for the kill, Xena draws her chakram and fires it into his chest, killing him. She then puts out a hand to help Hercules to his feet. Hercules says, You saved my life. And Xena responds, Yet again. Smash cut to the main title. Hercules sounds like a dick. <laughs> yeah. I love a like little in the arrest. I love a fight scene. They start out with like, she can kick everybody's ass. She's better than Hercules. I don't hate it. Okay. How do you feel about the fact that she's working as Hercules' right-hand woman rather than leading her own um, independent army? Trash. <laughs> mm -hmm. Only if we get a really satisfying moment where she, like, um, overthrows him. I feel like I would like it more if her plan all along was to overthrow him and she was infiltrating the army. We resume on a camp full of waving flags bearing the image of Hercules wrestling a lion. I think that's kind of cool. He bears a standard of himself fighting the Nemean lion. That's fun. <laughs> the soldiers are feasting. With, with squires and slaves. I read that as squirrels and slaves. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Whenever it says resume, I read it resume. 
<laughs> Go on, I'm listening. Hercules is talking about how he killed the giant, and how when they return to the city of Argos, the king will shower them with wealth. So this is supposed to be like a gritty adult version, or <laughs> like, yeah. Okay. Is this supposed to be the king they're talking about? The breast of the great whore? Yeah, I think so. I think, yeah, they're talking about, like, getting as much money as they can. And Hercules is like, you're going to be sucking dick? (laughs) (laughs) Awkward. Let's move onward. Let's move on. (laughs) Let's move on. (laughs) Elsewhere, Xena is washing her bloody hands in a basin as Hercules approaches. He accuses her of disobeying him and making him look weak. Quote, I should take your head right here and now. And Xena says, When I'm worth so much more whole? Hercules doesn't know whether to slap or kiss her, and Xena knows that she has to stroke his ego to ensure peace between them. I'm literally gonna vomit, and now she's like playing nice because what? She thinks she can't hold her own against him? Bro. So I I think, I, I think supposed to be the point that they're setting up a situation where the joke is that she's a lot better than he is he's a dick and she's just in this sort of like unfair no she would bounce (laughs) like she doesn't need to do that she can lead her own fucking army she can just kill him I, I, I guess this is a universe where she does need to do that he grabs her wrist and says they ever find out what really happened in that battle Xena counters. They never do. Your legendary journeys are safe with me. And he breaks into laughter. So I think the implication here is that she has been, um, she's been really like doing all of his legendary tasks and he's been taking the credit. Yeah, I don't like that. I think it's meant to be like a commentary of some kind on like. This is an interesting dynamic, but I'm not really following like why you would do it. With Hercules and Xena. Then she goes on to say that they should return to Argos, take the city by force, and rule their own kingdom. Oh no, is she in love with him? I, I, I'm i gonna give them the benefit of the doubt and say that, like, she's pretending. She was introduced originally as this semi seductress sort of character who wouldn't, like, who would pretend to be really into people to just get them to do what she wanted. So maybe that's what's happening here. Quote, You say you're the son of God, but you serve a mere man. Hercules' eyes burn with scorn at her impertinence, and he shows her the back of his hand, indicating a slap. Is Hercules threatening to slap her? Oh, gross. Yeah, he threatens to slap her. And then she's like, haha, I'm flirtatious. It's such an interesting dynamic, because series one, episode one, she literally says to Draco, you picked the wrong woman to get rough with. He's got a scar on his face that she gave him. Like, she had a men treating her badly era, and it was ten years ago. It's all like, ooh, Xena can't, like, run an army on her own, so she's, like, using her feminine sexy wiles to, like, what? Yeah, I have to believe that she is um, playing a long game here, because this isn't Xena. But Xena gives him a sexy smile and distracts him, saying, let me build you an army. Let me shoulder your labors. Let me write your name across history in big, bloody letters. And you would be what? My queen? Your equal. I would be to To you you as as a a ruler. I I can't read. I would be to you as a ruler as I am in battle. I would be to you. I would be to you. That that doesn't make sense. To you as a ruler. (laughs) I would be to you as a ruler as I am in battle i think is the cadence that we need i think i'm just dumb it's going to take more than that to make you my equal and xena says try me and then they have sex in the tent ew god just stab him so this is sort of the first establishing scene we're like kind of getting this as the establishment of xena's character and then she's supposed to be like showing that she's better than him because she's riding him so she's on the top so she's you know winning <laughs> In at sex, I think is the subtext. You know what this kind of reminds me of? The um the sequel to Three Hundred. I, I can't. Oh, I, like, yeah. I can't remember any of the characters' names, <laughs> but there is that scene in the tent, and that I imagine you guys know what I'm talking about—the sex scene. Um, I know exactly what you're talking about. 
Yeah, Artemisia. Fade to black. Time passes and Xena is exiting the tent when she hears a cry. She turns to see a 12-year-old girl in chains along with several other women. Xena asks Pentacles, the soldier holding the chains, who they are, and he says that they are the giant's wife and children. Xena says, the giant had a wife? And Pentacles gives her a creepy smile and is like, yes, and children. Um. After we have our fun, they will join the king's harem. Okay. So, it's, it's, okay, hold on. <laughs> Why wouldn't she already know? Because presumably she's been traveling with Hercules for quite some time. This shouldn't be new information. I also feel like there's that thread of, like, like gendered violence that was introduced with Hercules threatening to slap her that makes this, like, like, it doesn't seem like it would surprise her. So it cuts away and screams and commotion rouse Hercules from his sleep. His men are shouting about missing prisoners, and Pentacles is lying in a pool of blood next to the shattered chains of his prisoners. Hercules asks who did this, and Iolas says, We were all by the fire, waiting for him to bring us the prisoners. All of us. Except for Xena. So I, I guess this is just a big, like, rape army. Like, which I'm not saying that didn't happen in ancient Greece, but they're just really <sighs> underlining, like, Aeolus literally goes, all of us. They're just really underlining that, like, all of these people that Xena has been traveling with were, like, were, like, lining up to... to this is such a tired thing that these We're So Gritty series want to do. You know, like... Ugh. It's so tiring. I know the the writer and the network parted ways due to, like, creative differences. I wonder if this is one of the things that, like, the post-Game of Thrones industry was trying to demand and, like, he felt uncomfortable providing. Hercules asks her if she did this, and Xena's like, of course not. I was with you the whole time. Unless you're saying we weren't together that long. Wink. They discuss going after the prisoners, and Xena basically says to leave them alone. They're children, for Gaia's sake. And Z- Okay, all right. Okay. 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 And Hercules says, you've killed children. Um, hold on, I need a minute to process that. Because it's a mercy compared to slavery. Yeah, that's a great reason. What the fuck? Hold on. Hold on. I need to process this. Because in the original series, she famously never killed Agreed. W- women and children who were non-combatants. Um, and and it, it, was, it was one of her lieutenants doing that in her absence that put her up against him and eventually lost her her army when they revolted. So Xena mm. refusing to cross that line of killing children, or at least like killing children on purpose, it was very explicitly stated. And I'm trying to contemplate if I want to watch a TV show about a Xena who kills kids. Pass. I think it's giving a strong, like, we're setting up like slavery is even worse than murder, which like... <laughs> That's a really strong assertion to make. But it's not someone... Obviously, this is a very complicated discussion that, like, it's it's probably too complicated and too serious for us to really get into here, but it's not someone choosing death over lack of freedom. It's a, a third party choosing to murder someone rather than see them enslaved. Which I, I don't... And then I'm seeing a few lines down... Hercules, like, I thought you understood how men conquer kingdoms by letting their soldiers rape women and children. Which is also not necessarily true. Like, a woman could order that type of heinous behavior just as easily. It's not... It's, it's, it's just setting up this really strange gender dynamic that I don't... I know we're only, like, 13 pages in, <laughs> but everything in terms of, like, the gender dynamics, and it, it's just so heavy-handed. Mm-hmm. And, like, um, it's, like, smashes you on the head with, oh, look at all these terrible men. And They argue. Hercules knows she's guilty, and he loudly declares her a traitor. A soldier attacks Xena, and she kills him. Then she basically says, 
The giant had Hercules cornered, and I saved his life. I killed the giant. He will betray anyone who discovers the truth. But the soldiers are unconvinced, and Hercules proceeds to attack her, takes her chakram, and frankly beats the ever-loving shit out of her while the men join in. For reference, in the original, he does he does beat her in a fight. Oh, but this is a lot of beating. Like, this is a lot. What I think this is doing... <clears throat> In the OG, after her army betrayed her and one of her lieutenants took the army away from her, he put her through a gauntlet and said, like, this is the only way a warrior can leave with pride. You have to walk through the gauntlet. And if you survive, then you can leave. And then when she survived at the end, they all refused to attack her anymore, even though he gave the order to kill her and finish it because they all respected the fact that she'd survived. Right. So I think. So what when was this script written? 2015 or 2016? Okay. Yeah, this just seems very um, gratuitous. Mm -hmm. The like so far, we've got what rape, slavery, uh, toxic masculinity, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and now we have extreme violence against the one woman who supposedly is better than you know all these other men. So. That's cool. If you're starting off a show, you obviously have to sort of condense things in terms of origin story to get them going, right? But one thing that comes to mind is that in the, the trilogy of Hercules episodes she was introduced in, she doesn't accomplish what she meant to do, which was kill Hercules or get him to kill his best friend. And her army fled. But, like, no one really defeated her. Mm. She She was sort of physically unbeaten in episode one and then went through the gauntlet in episode two this is starting out her pilot episode with like a, a big a big beating he calls her a whore wait what he calls her a whore <laughs> oh man i feel like this series would needs to have like a bingo card Literally, no one wants this for Xena. I'm, I'm. <laughs> God, it's like people looked at the success of Game of Thrones and just pulled out the most uh, shallow surface level, um, you know, parts of the the series, and it's like this must be what people want. Yeah, maybe this was a note from the network, being like, <laughs> make it more Game of Thrones. Honestly, I get, yeah, like who knows. Who knows who wanted this? I mean, this was after Rob Tappert had already done Spartacus, and that was, you know, it had slavery and assault and bad language. I mean, may, I, mm, but I don't think he had any creative input on this, or at least I hadn't thought so. They were like, you know what people want to see in a Xena reboot? They want Hercules to call her a whore. I'm, all right, let's backtrack a second before that. She weathers it impressively, but she's losing the fight pretty badly. Xena also says something about how she had trusted Hercules. There are a couple of times in the original series that you flash back to like 10 years ago, when she would have been not 20 years old yet. And she was pretty seriously betrayed by um, a couple of people she trusted, Caesar being the big one. And then ten, you know, almost 10 years later, right before the start of her own series, where she's well into her 20s and she's very experienced as a warlord, she was using a couple of them. But the guy who ended up betraying her was not someone she was romantically involved in. So I just find it really interesting that they've they've brought us up to the start of her own solo series um, and have her betrayed by a romantic partner that she purportedly actually trusted. Like, well, doesn't that line imply that she wasn't just playing him? I think so, but it also doesn't make sense textually in terms of, like, she should know by now. She's been traveling with them for how long? Like, she knows that he has his men do this. He, she knows that she has to lie to him to, like, cover her tracks if she lets people go. Like, why would she trust him? She doesn't have any reason to. This is a lot, guys. I can't believe he called her a whore. I'm... <laughs> Then Hercules drags Xena to a horse and ties her to it, so it can basically drag her to death. Also, like, I, I guess this isn't a big thing, but in the original, like, kind of like I mentioned, there was a whole point to the fact that, like, she survived and walked away, and they respected that so much that they let her go. 
And the... It's almost an issue of dignity. Cut to the next scene, across the countryside. A peasant's hand-drawn cart careens onto the horse's path, pulled by a young red-haired woman. She cuts the line between a basically unconscious Zena and the horse. Then she pulls a roll of first aid supplies from the cart and works on Zena's injuries. It's really interesting to me how original Zena was the rescuer and was the skilled healer, and here Gabrielle's doing the rescuing and the healing. Yeah, this is really interesting. Why is, like... Okay, I don't, I don't hate it, uh, conceptually. It's just a different dynamic. She brings Zena in the cart with her, but they encounter slavers on the road. Gabrielle says... You may not want to come too close to us for your own safety. Look at the lesions on my sister's skin. My village healer says it was leprosy. She removes one of Xena's bandages, revealing the bloody skin underneath. Did I mention we're on our way to a leper colony? Look, I don't judge how you make your living, but if you want to chain us up and sell us to some brothel, you may find your repeat business taking a hit. The slavers run away and Zena's like, Wow, you saved me with nothing but words. Very OG series, Gabrielle. She was trapped by a cyclops and talked her way out of it in the pilot very in line for her character i'm just fascinated because literally in the original episode xena saved gabrielle from a group of slavers mm -hmm. and now she's like saving xena from slavers right which i don't inherently hate it but i am noticing that yet again there is like another threat of sexualized violence in like every interaction that's happened with anyone so far mm-hmm I would. I am willing to bet um, a lot that if this had gone on to become a series, eventually one of them would have been uh, raped, and then they would use that as a device for the two of them to get closer. Oh God! I bet you're right. I hate that, but I think you're right. Neither of them realize it yet, but the greatest relationship of each of these women's lives has been born. We're then introduced to Gabrielle's small village and her father Herodotus, the blacksmith. What does nomadic Eastern flavor mean in this context, do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Who's obviously doubtful of their unconscious new guest. Gabrielle protests. Someone beat her half to death and tied her to a horse to finish the job. And her sister Lilla goes, what if she deserved it? To which Gabrielle says, who deserves that? All right, cycling back around to the, like, you've killed children thing. <laughs> um... As opposed to, like, the OG series where they were introduced with Xena literally saving her from slavers, here all she's done is lie on the ground bleeding. So she's shown nothing. If the fight had gone the other way and Xena had tied Hercules to a horse, dragged off to his death, Gabrielle would still have rescued him and would still be defending him right now. Gabrielle convinces them to let Xena stay and heal, evoking the memory of her dead mother to do so. Ooh, the mom is dead. Of course, we need the sad dead mom. Of course. That night, Herodotus and Xena have a conversation. She's like, I can tell that you're a decent man who thinks he's facing an indecent person. And Gabrielle's dad says, am I wrong? He threatens her with his blacksmith's hammer, and she admits that she knows they are Scythians, and that she defeated the Scythian king in battle before implying there would be a big reward for her capture. Herodotus isn't interested eventually saying that she can stay and that he'll keep her secrets from Gabrielle. Zena says, I will protect your daughter. I promise. First of all, that's not what he asked for. <laughs> he said, get out. <laughs> I like this whole talk between the two of them. I've always been fascinated by outside perspectives on her and the sort of uneasy relationship she's always had with Gabrielle's parents. But it's interesting that they're tying her promise to protect Gabrielle to her dad. To some man. Yeah, this is also the first guy we've seen that isn't a rapist, so I feel like he's gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> We're then treated to a flashback of nine-year-old Xena, part of a gang of enslaved women and children, including her mother. Her mother tries to protect her from a whipping and dies. I'm just like tired already <laughs> mm -hmm. God, it's, like, it's just so predictable this is filled with like everything that we've already seen so we got one scene without the threat of sectional sexual violence with a the man there and then we immediately smashed cut they're saying that she thinks that slavery is worse than death because she was enslaved she was raped multiple times 
she's lived a terrible life with men who wanted to harm her and succeeded in harming her her entire life. Like, that's it. That's what it is. I When I read this part of her backstory, I was convinced that I was accidentally reading into something um, that wasn't actually meant to be implied. So maybe, maybe it's not meant to be quite that um, awful. Maybe we can still give them the benefit of the doubt here. Back in present day, fast forward to Gabrielle telling her father that she knows Zena's name now because Zena talks in her sleep. Zena talks in her sleep? Yeah. Do you not talk in your sleep in the third person? Then Lilla enters the smithy and is like, Hey Gabby, your evil friend's trying to run away. I do like your evil friends trying to run away. I do appreciate that. Zena's still injured, so Gabrielle catches up to her quickly and says, Keep insisting on leaving before you heal, and I may just let you. She said she'd protect Gabrielle. What's she even doing? Well, we know she's a big fat liar, so I mean, she's killed children. It's not the worst thing she's done. They argue, Zena saying that she has to leave to meet her destiny, and Gabrielle saying that Zena won't last a day on her own. Gabrielle says, Maybe I'm taking time off my busy schedule of meeting my destiny to try to help you. Maybe I want to leave the farm, go to Athens, enroll in the Lyceum, become a bard, and tell my stories to the world. And am I doing that? No, because I'm helping you. That is, that is Gabrielle from the OG. She wanted to be a bard. That's really cute. I like that they have that. And Zena's basically like, you should have left me where you found me. And Gabrielle essentially goes, you're so angry and have no sense of gratitude. You are the worst person I've ever met. That is also true. She is objectively the worst person you've ever met. She has murdered children. <laughs> Zena asks Gabrielle if she's ever fought anyone and says that Gabrielle wouldn't survive the road to Athens without knowing self-defense. Gabrielle is like, well, pardon me for not leading a dark and mysterious life of an unremitting brutality, but I happen to believe that words change history, not violence. I think Gabrielle is the best written character in this so far. Like, it's Yeah, she's telling me on it. Mm -hmm. Her dialogue's cute. It's fun. Zena offers to train her, both as a thank you for saving her life and as a way to get herself back up to fighting shape. Time passes as they train, and Zena heals. We also see Herodotus and Zena hammering at a new sword together. Gabrielle is awful at using the sword, but Zena teaches her to use her old cane like a staff instead. I like the image of Zena and Gabrielle's dad forging a sword together for some reason. I, I do enjoy that. There's also a brief scene of Zena plucking mysterious flowers by the river. Back in a brothel in Argos, we see both male and female sex workers mingling with Hercules' men. Oh, we're in a brothel. Uh, mark that off the uh, bingo card. Oh, look. Equality. Male and female sex workers. They say sex workers above and then whores here. Oh, and look, he's bisexual. Diversity win? Rapists can be bisexual? Hercules stops the festivities and says that the king has a new mission for them. He's giving Hercules an entire legion in order to attack a group of nomadic tribes in the east, the Scythians. Not just an army, an entire legion. How many, how many people is that, Emily? Oh, fuck. I think, I think it's 4,000 something, but I could be very wrong. Oh, she's looking it up. <laughs> Numbered between 3,000 and 6,000. Why do you need 4,000 people to do that? I mean, I guess, well, okay. A lot of the Central Asian nomads were um, really good horsemen historically and really good bowmen. And they were actually really hard, even for big established armies to beat because you you would just you'd have to track them down first of all they would they would run off fire a bunch of arrows at you and then just kind of disappear on their horses and it was hard to have like a staged battle against them oh really oh fuck off seesaw fornication and inebriation okay. isn't that how you speak when you're at the um what do you call it the brothel the brothel quick let us fornicate and inebriate ourselves this is your colonel speaking. Back with Gabrielle, Herodotus warns his daughter that people in the village disapprove of Xena training her for combat and says he's not raising her to wield weapons or kill people. Herodotus also says he's heard rumors in town about who Xena is, an enemy of the people who once led a legion of killers and was called the Destroyer of Nations. Gabrielle doesn't believe it, but then Lilla shows her the white flower she saw Xena plucking, which Gabrielle recognizes. So she goes and confronts a now fully healed Xena, attacking her with her staff. Xena's like, 
This is cute. <laughs> that's pretty this accurate. Is cute. See, that's, that's good for them. That's fine. Yeah. And flippantly treats it like a training exercise. Then Gabrielle brings out the white flower, says she knows it's a powerful poison called Hellebore that can kill an entire village, and asks why Xena has it. Gabrielle also says she rubbed it on her staff before attacking Xena, but will give her the antidote if she tells her the truth. Xena's like, give me the antidote, and rears up her sword about to kill Gabrielle. Gabrielle says, if I die, you won't know where I put the antidote. So tell me, are you the destroyer of nations? Xena tosses the sword away and basically says, I mean you no harm. I mean you no harm, but she was, like, gonna kill her. I think she means, like, I, I would have meant you no harm, but you said that you poisoned me. Maybe it's that. I feel like their Xena characterization is really not doing it for me. I can't understand, like, what emotions she's feeling. I can't understand what's motivating her. The poison is for someone else, someone I trusted. See, there again, they're confirming that she trusted Hercules. So she's a much more naive person now at the start of this series than she was at the start of her OG one, which is interesting to me, but okay. Maybe we're just expected to believe that she is a product of, you know, that time. Mm. So, and she hasn't yet wrapped her poor feminine brain about around uh, being able to lead armies herself. <laughs> she talks about her backstory with Hercules, though she doesn't say his name. Just that she joined her army with his, but he turned her men against her. Oh, for God's sake. Which of those... Wait. Which of those men were hers, then? Those were her men? Those were her men. But then... Apparently, that's what it's saying. Carl, why are you so surprised that you guys got slaves, then? <laughs> I feel like they're giving Hercules Caesar's original position. Someone she's like so trusted and swore herself to his banner and then he betrayed her, da 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 da. But like, why? Gabrielle admits that she was completely bluffing about the poison. I like that. That is something she would do. Here we go again with Gabrielle being the best and most consistently well-written character so far. And Xena realizes that, quote, This naive young thing has completely and utterly punked her. Months pass. They're arguing about Xena leaving again, and Gabrielle is like, So you're gonna go kill a man, and then what? You haven't thought of it? You're going to march out of here and kill a man, and you don't care who you leave behind or what's in front of you. Well, yeah, which is a really great question. What are you doing after you get your vengeance? That's, that's, that's a good, you know, that's a good thing to discuss. The problem with this is that this is supposed to be like, I don't know, some... I, like it's revenge but it's also i'm assuming leading to her like your redemption or whatever but the problem is that it is mm -hmm. it began with such a stupid mm -hmm. <laughs> like, incident. like it doesn't make any sense if just all of this is built upon a moment that was nonsensical agreed and xena didn't choose to walk away in the series she did act as her moral compass um sometimes uh, like, totally, but they already met when Xena had sort of, you know, figured her shit out. It just completely changes the dynamic that, that, that it's Gabrielle's affection and influence that makes Xena change her mind to begin with. I don't... Yeah, no, I don't like it. Then she invites Xena to come with her to Athens, saying Xena could do something better with her life there. But then they hear horses approaching, and it's the Scythian king's guard. Xena apologizes, assuming it's her own fault. She is an enemy of the Scythians, and she thinks they're coming for her. She goes, They will search your home and torture your family. And she starts to basically make an attack plan. Gabrielle scolds her for trying to solve every problem with violence, and goes to talk to them. So I feel like there's a lot of, I'm sorry, like Gabrielle, uh, Xena kind of looking like an idiot. I think they're trying to make Gabrielle look competent, which is cool. But I don't know why, like... Zena's constantly getting outsmarted by her because Zena's incredibly intelligent. It's because Zena is supposed to be being shown here that violence isn't the only way because she can't realize it on her own and Gabrielle has to be like, oh, the guiding light of her life. Turns out that King Nayar is there in person and he says to Gabrielle's family that he has a big secret to tell them. I also have to say that I read this as pediatrician because I'm still so very tired. 
<laughs> An army has arisen. They raise our settlements, slaughter the men, and abduct our women and children. They seek to annihilate us. To protect you, my people, I sought an alliance through marriage with Raxos of Ceramatia. He commands legions who would fight for us. But my daughter, my princess, my failure, she's run away. We seek a woman who resembles my daughter's beauty. Raxos only met her once in childhood. With the right girl taking the role of the princess, we will be defended. And so Gabrielle is basically the princess's doppelganger, and the king wants her to pretend to be his daughter so he can marry her off and form the alliance. This is way too early to have the doppelganger episode. Like, we haven't met them yet. It's not funny yet. <laughs> right? Like, in a slapstick humor universe, this is some great nonsense right here, and I'm super into it. But, like, in a gritty, dark, either it's tonally dissonant, or this is supposed to be, like... You don't have a choice about whether or not you have sex in a political marriage. Gabrielle agrees to go for the greater good, despite her father's protestations. I want a life of peace and happiness for everyone. Mother would have agreed. They prepare to leave, but Zena's trying to protest. She says, this is obscene. What about your life? Is this what you want to be traded off to some barbarian? I just keep seeing that as Roxas. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I've heard tell of Raxus. He's as bad as whoever leads that army that's coming. Look at this section. Down here, Raxos will make you give him heirs until he breaks your body and your mind. Oh, oh, like they just won't stop with the sexual violence. How much gold is your father taking to whore you out to his king? They love the word whore. For what? For what? I don't know how to defend that. I'm... What I think they're trying to do is... <laughs> is be feminist in the way that's like, look at all these awful, horrific things that women have to go through. But like, that's not... Zena, I understand it, but it's something I could never do. Bro, you just had sex with a man who threatened to slap you <sighs> that you know has been letting his men rape all these women and children. But you say you couldn't do a political marriage? Because she was, she was practically ready to do a political marriage. She wanted to conquer... She wanted to have her own country, and she was like, we can do this together. I'll do all of your, like, labors for you, and they'll grant you this, and I'll rule side by side by you. Like, this is exactly what Zeno was just doing. She offers to try to help her, but Gabrielle just is like, do you know any solution to a problem other than killing? Gabrielle just tells her to go to Athens and live for both of them. How to say it? It doesn't feel grounded in the awareness that if you say, I would rather die than be raped, like, you very well could die at least like show that they are being like uh, an unreliable narrator when they say like i would never choose to do that then she leaves and fast forward they arrive in serana the nomad city it's full of massive tent buildings and yellow gray and purple sigils red haired light skinned and heavily tattooed there's no mixed people in the scythian glitterati Gabrielle gets prepped by the king's people to receive the same complicated heraldic tattoos once worn by the princess. We see the tattooing process, and Gabrielle cries in pain while it happens. Okay. But, like, she was already part of this culture, but she didn't have tattoos for some reason. It's an interesting question. Why did Xena call the Scythian king a barbarian if they're part of the same culture? Unless she was also calling Gabrielle a barbarian. Far away from the nomad city, Xena has been journeying across the countryside and finally sees the sigil of Hercules again. She also encounters two scouts, one of whom is scolding his horse, Argo. Argo? Argo? Okay, so presumably Xena's gonna kill these scouts and take Argo. Xena kills the first scout and puts the pinch on the second one, questioning him about where Hercules is. The scout admits they're marching to attack Zorana, the nomad capital. Mm, Zena does mm -hmm. the pinch! Yay! The pinch! Oh, I, you know what? I completely forgot about that. <laughs> what does Hercules want with the Scythians? He wants to exterminate, kill the king, and enslave his heirs! Wow! Shocking! You know, it's kind of getting to the point that I'm just, like, offended on Hercules' behalf. <laughs> like, the whole figure. <laughs> I was ready to talk shit about him when we started, but now I'm like, why would you treat Hercules like this? Yeah. This is trash. Oh my god, are you reading the bottom of this page? 
Xena turns away. Remember how, in the original series, Xena would always take the nerve pinch off after getting what she wants? This ain't that. Oh my god. In the original series, back when she was evil, Xena didn't take the nerve pinch off after getting what she wanted. They made a point of showing that scene. I've just cut off the flow of blood to your brain. What do you want to know? Nothing. This isn't original. She did this when she was evil in the OG. Xena looks back and forth between the direction of the camp and the horses, deciding between going to take her revenge or saving Gabrielle. I like this conceptually. In the end, she takes the scout's horse and leaves to find Gabrielle. So, your name is Argo? I hope you're fast. I'm coming, Gabrielle. She finds the Nomad City quickly and sneaks into Gabrielle's tent. Gabrielle is alone, staring at her now unfamiliar tattooed body in the mirror, while her sister Lilla sleeps behind her. Are you reading this part where Gabrielle stares at her naked body in the mirror, being like, wow, I'm so exotic and tattooed right now. Ah. Yes, everything about this has been very male gazy. Xena pops in and is like, what have they done to you? Gabrielle whirls around and asks what she's doing there, and Xena tells her that they have to leave immediately. Quote, Your people are as good as dead. An army is coming. They're on a mission to kill the king and enslave his heirs. They march under the sigil of Hercules. Gabrielle says, By Hera! He's the man who hurt you? The one who stole your army? Had you beaten? Tied to a horse? Xena loses her patience and is like, Yes, yes, I was there. Okay, I laughed at that line a little bit. I know! I was there! <laughs> but Gabrielle has realized that Xena had the chance to take revenge and turned it down to save her, saying, And you came for me instead? It seems like an unusually selfless gesture coming from you. Xena says she's repaying her debt, reminds Gabrielle that genocide is at the gates, and they get ready and run. She says, We will escape, we will fetch your father, and I will personally see you to Athens. Understood? Gabrielle nods, beaming because this is the moment when Xena begins her path to redemption. Excuse me? Okay, you know what? The, like, tone of Gabrielle's dialogue, I think, is in character for her. But this? This? What is Gabrielle supposed to be? Who is she supposed to be as a human being? She's like, I'm going to save my people. And then, Ga and then Xena's like, we're going to run off to Athens to save your life. And she's like... Yay, I'm happy. I don't care about genocide is at the gates because you're going to be a good person now. What? My God, yeah. Go ring the alarm and start shouting and tell people to get out. Like, at least wake people up or something. Come up with a plan to save people. Whatever. This is just like, wow. She's beaming. Xena comes in and says, your people are about to be genocided, and I know you wanted to help them, but, like, we're gonna bounce, and she's beaming about it. But the attack has already begun. Fire erupts everywhere. Xena blasts out of Gabrielle's room. I, I imagine this, like, <laughs> her just busting straight through a wooden door, and there's showers. <laughs> <laughs> like Wonder Woman style. One of Nayar's soldiers comes in and says, the king has ordered us to fall back to his stronghold. You will be safe there. I thought this was a nomad city. What strongholds do they have? I thought this was all tents. It's like a really tall tent. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they like carried a tent, put it up on top of a cliff or something. Gabrielle agrees to go with him, but insists that Xena comes with her, pretending Xena is a handmaiden. They all run outside together, but the Herculean soldiers are already upon them, and Nayar's royal guards engage. Hercules' men hack down Gabrielle's protectors without mercy. Xena unleashes a storm of ultraviolence, cutting down Hercules' soldiers like so many sides of beef. Hercules arrives wearing the Nemean lion head for a helmet and bearing Xena's stole chakram, and we see Aeolus dragging a bloodied and beaten Nayar to the center of the city to be executed by Hercules. So I guess, like, the stronghold thing is not working. <laughs> The tent is just not enough. <laughs> the tent is <laughs> not enough. It wasn't high enough. <laughs> <laughs> they are obsidia. I'm probably pronouncing this wrong. I've probably been pronouncing it wrong this entire time because there was no soft C in Greek, so it would probably be Scythia. You can't see how hard I just rolled my eyes. Xena pulls out a dagger and hurls it across the square into Hercules' shoulder. Yola sees her and shouts, It's Xena! She's alive! And she has the princess! 
if she can toss a dagger with accuracy that that distance, just like do it in his throat. Right? <laughs> Kill him. One shot and it's over. I like the idea that they would assume Xena was there to screw them over. Whereas right. actually she's there for reasons that have nothing to do with them. I like that sort of like. Xena goes after Hercules to get her chakra back and they fight. He beat the shit out of you, girl, last time. There, it wasn't even a contest. I don't know why you're going toe-to-toe with him now. Eolus grabs Gabrielle and another Herculean soldier grabs Lilla and is about to kill her. Gabrielle basically shouts to Xena, Save Lilla! They want me alive, so please save her, not me! So Xena stops fighting Hercules and runs to save Lilla. She succeeds, but Gabrielle is now chained and gagged by Eolus, and Eolus and Hercules load her onto a chariot and tear ass out of the square. Xena, I like how she just slings Lila over her shoulder like a sack of potatoes. Love it. Xena, with Lila slung over her shoulder, obviously can't catch up. Oh man, I was expecting like a Fast and the Furious carriage race. <laughs> <laughs> the scene cuts to black, and then as the sun rises, we see King Nayar's surviving courtiers dabbing his forehead and cleaning the wounds dealt to him by Hercules. Xena is brought before him, and they have a confrontation about her past fighting against the Scythians. Xena just says, I did not come to attack you. I came to warn your princess of the danger. Hercules is my enemy, just as he is yours. The king doesn't believe her, but Lilla stands up for her. She's not our enemy. She has lived among us for months. She's a member of my family and came here to save the princess. Member of your family? Damn. You just met her a couple months ago. It's a very heartfelt family dynamic, I guess. And Xena warns Nayar that Hercules will take Gabrielle to Argos and present her as a prize to the king, who will make her a concubine in his royal harem. No. Yep, yep. Wow. Another threat of sexual violence. Unpredictable. Xena also says that she knows Hercules and convinces the king that she should go after Gabrielle solo, even though he wants to gather his army and attack Argos properly. In the end, the king lets Xena and Lilith go. Yeah, why would you do that? Why would, if, if one single legion working for the king just overran your capital city entirely, then how do you think you could possibly wage an assault on the capital city itself? In the last few scenes of the episode, we see Xena and Herodotus forging a new sword together. Xena straps on the new sword, puts on new armor very closely resembling Xena's classic armor. But hopefully less boobacious. Uh, more boobacious. <laughs> Maybe it'll even have nipples. <laughs> Oh, that does sound empowering. And mounts Argo, the stolen horse. Herodotus says, Go get our girl! I like that, that's cute. Lilla reaches out and touches Xena's outstretched hand. Xena nods and lets out a mighty, Yeah! And takes off on the horse. An archetypal hero on a legendary quest to rescue the woman who will, in time, become her truest companion. The end. And now, I mean, her journey to go save her is literally just going to save her from, like, sexual slavery. What's happening to Gabrielle this entire time? She's in Hercules' camp, and then she's going to be thrown into the king's harem. Like, so so what do we think is happening to her now? Oh, big Didn't, big. didn't I say? What's going to happen? She's going to be raped, and then they're going to have, like, you know, um, Gabrielle and Xena will have, will use this as a, uh, you know, bonding at any rate, I really tried to think of something redeeming when you asked for positives and like the two funny lines and I guess Gabrielle's voice in dialogue are the only ones I can think of. Like the action scenes aren't terrible, I guess, but there's not even any swing, swing, swing. She doesn't even have her fucking thing. If you had a story in 1995 where like a woman was introduced at the head of her own army and here she's the second in command. And then you're introduced to this girl looks at her and says, this is what I've always wanted is freedom. Let me come with you. Teach me everything. And she agrees to take her with her and they go off on adventures together. But here the attempted slavery kidnapping is successful and she's going to be treated with violence and many other horrific things for a significant amount of time before Zena can catch up to her and rescue her. And they get together because fate has, fate has forced them together because of their various injuries and the various ways they have both been uh, victimized. 
And then maybe they will go off and adventure together after that. But it's not through their own choice. And it's not through their own um, agency. Yeah. (laughs) They were like, it has to be feminist. So all the men have to be terrible, irredeemable people who like to rape women. That does sound feminist, doesn't it? Also, their idea of like any sort of character character development for a woman is overcoming um, sexual trauma. Right. How else would you have a personality? Look, I'm sure there's a Xena fan somewhere out there who would have really loved this. And like for that person, I'm so sorry this never got made. Like there's cool ideas in here somewhere. It's just, I really wish that there was a stamp that got put on scripts so that you could tell if it was like wholesale, the idea of the writer, or if it was based on like producer and and network interference because this is the lesbians deserve better <laughs> try it smells like musty old leather to me well, to the non-creative person perhaps so i think every fan sort of has their fantasy of exactly what they would like to see in a reboot i imagine most of our opinions don't entirely overlap and a lot of people's wishes in this area are probably highly personalized in terms of their own experiences and what Xena Warrior Princess meant to them at the time that they saw it first. But just for funsies, we're going to sit down and have a little discussion about what we would like to see if the series was ever brought back to life with the original actors on board. Work. All right, let's spend a little while being ridiculously self-indulgent. First thing is just the question of tone. So when you get to this sort of like action, adventure, fantasy type of genre, there's a bunch of different examples, right? You've got your prestige stuff, which is like Lord of the Rings, Gladiator. You've got the more pedestrian stuff, which is like the King Arthur movie, lower budget stuff like Vikings or Black Sails, and then stuff that was kind of trying to be prestige but ended up boring, like Wheel of Time, Rings of Power. And then there's like comedic and campy stuff, really high camp, like Our Flag Means Death, more low budget is like Merlin, and then like blockbusters like Pirates of the Caribbean, semi-serious adventure fantasy like The Witcher or The Mandalorian or like Shadow and Bone. And then there's like super serious with sex and violence and that's basically like game of thrones and spartacus and there's a lot of adaptions that lose the humor that had like that like the original had and massively suffer for it so you've got stuff like mulan and avatar the ls airbender and lion king if they were bringing it back one last hurrah what sort of tone would you want it to have if the goal of the mini series is to cater to the fans who loved it and to give it one last final hurrah, but not really worried necessarily about profitability. Mm. Um, which I don't know why I would even imply that that would be an option. But like, here we are. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would say go all out, make it campy, make it fun, make it over the top. But give it yeah. the production value. Just I just want them romping around in New Zealand. Yeah. I yeah. want to see them on that same hill that we've seen them 800 times on. Yeah. Something like Vikings... Um had maybe a budget of like five million per episode yeah and they were able to do a fair amount with that i could see them with a budget of two and a half million per episode and being just fine i i I will say you have to just be careful because i know lucy has said that if she were to come back she doesn't want to do like any crazy stunts yeah um and she doesn't want to wear the same outfit yes so let's talk about the outfit I'm ready to talk about the outfit. I have so many thoughts on what you could do to basically keep the same general theme and silhouette, but update it, A, for comfort, Mm -hmm. which is the main thing for everyone involved, Mm -hmm. and also to still pay tribute to some of that Maori armor design. Um, I would put her in loose leather breeches. Uh Uh-huh. Which is infinitely more practical when you're horseback riding. 
Um, her chest wouldn't be exposed, although she might have a, a neckline that comes Uh down. huh. And I would I would drop the bustier. She doesn't need cleavage Yeah. anymore. She doesn't need the corset. We're taking the corset out. We're taking the push-up bra out. It can go fuck itself. Yeah, she she's she's earned Yeah. not having to do that. So I've got a couple of inspirations. <laughs> Big fan. We'd have to de-western it, but yeah. Yeah. So like I like the layers and the lace up and how it's open here. I like how it's still got armbands. It's very trekking through the woods. It's very different layers of color and visible wear. It's still very stylish and cool looking. I think you can take a lot of inspiration from that. And you can see how he's got tall boots and it's over basically leggings. And then Mm he hmm does have this lace up thing that like comes down to the knee. It's got a belt cinching it in. I feel like this is a really good like inspiration to take from in terms of the general part of the silhouette and the vibe. right. Especially if we did the overcoat and more of a tunic vibe. Yeah. You know, to really pull the the grease where she is. Yeah. Yes. Good. Yeah. And then there's also because we still want to keep that sort of like that um, Maori design. This is embroidery. And this is the original Malila's design that would like it later inspired her armor, which Right. was a print on the cloth. So there's always the chance to have this sort of tunic type thing and embroider some of that onto it if you wanted to deal with that. I think embroidery would be a great idea. And then if she had armor, something like this is really cool. It's from Black Raven Armory. They do a bunch of stuff like this, but just generally this style thing, it's a leather base. And then you could either have bronze on it or you could have that design tooled into the leather. I could even see it being where um, Xena would pick if she doesn't expect she's going to be needing the bronze, she would just wear this leather. Yeah. And then she could even clip the bronze on over it if she Yeah. is like, oh, I'm going to be expecting like arrows. <laughs> this way you're not wearing 100% of the armor at every scene. You can kind of determine what's needed in that moment. What I say is we do not want to do is this. You remember her pregnancy outfit? I do remember the pregnancy outfit. God awful ugly. Yeah, I, she 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 deserved so much better. I, I put all those thoughts together about what I would like to see in a new outfit for her, and I commissioned an artist. <laughs> That's my girlfriend's art, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big fan of this. I I like commissioned this quite a bit. an artist. So sort of like with the Aragorn thing, like we were talking about this underlayer, Mm hmm, mm hmm. the red cloth and a tunic and then this sort of like black brown over tunic this could be laced up or it could be not i think it could be closed up to here if you wanted or unlaced but instead of a corset you've got like a few different belts going over and it drapes down like this around the back almost like an open coat and underneath you've still got that sort of roman skirt effect for the drape and then she's got leggings on she's still got the knee-high boots And then maybe like the shoulder pads are part of something that she could buckle on along with a, a leather and bronze breastplate if she wanted to. Um, under the, you know, her arms could either be bare or maybe like this red thing could connect and give her sleeves. Um, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, similar silhouette, more comfortable, more dignified for Lucy. Um, yeah. I like I like this design quite a bit. I think it's phenomenal. Me too. Really great artist, right? Right? Oh my god! We should somebody should tell that artist. Hey, babe, <laughs> fantastic art. She keeps messaging me like, can I post it online yet? No, not yet. Also, brief thoughts on Gabrielle's costume. Do you remember this early outfit of hers where she, it, she only wore it very briefly, but it was like this crossed over top and the skirt and boots. I feel like you could take this, just make it not a belly shirt. Have it close over slightly higher, you know, and it's a regular length. But it ties around the waist, which could give it a cinch if you want, or it doesn't have to if you don't want to. Give her a light, a longer skirt, the same leggings that Lucy's wearing. Give her the knee-high boots. And then I really liked this coat that she was I really wearing. like that I think coat. it was in season four. It looks really good on her. It looks really rustic. I feel like she could put it on top of this outfit if she didn't want to have her arms out, or she could take it off depending on what she wanted. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd make this skirt a little bit longer. Yeah. I'd Yeah. make it look not 90s, Yep. <laughs> you know, but like ultimately, 
rough hewn linens yeah. in natural dye tones would yeah. be normal. I, I would 100% make sure that, that I have any fucking authority in this. <laughs> I know, but yeah. um, that the actresses kind of got to help design their outfit. Absolutely. They, like they need they need to be comfortable in what they're wearing. Um comfort for them and then I would want the stunt women to put them on as well and be like, yes, yes this works for me and the job that I have to do. It also needs to be able to hide padding. Yes. Yeah. Completely. Which is why, ooh, that's another reason I like the coat and I like mm -hmm. the tunic potentially for Xena as well, because you can hide stuff under there. Yeah. What do you think about the hair? Because I feel like Xena should have her classic hair, but just like a less aggressively 90s version of that bang. Yeah, keep it the same silhouette. Okay, so a little quote. Lucy um, spent years saying that she was uninvolved in the reboot efforts, mm -hmm. and it was the new showrunners to do with as they pleased, not least because she hated the prospect of doing more action scenes. But she told Yahoo Entertainment in July 2019 that seeing Linda Hamilton return as Sarah Connor in Terminator Dark Fate made her wonder why she couldn't do the same with Xena. You can, Lucy. I saw Linda being amazing, and I'm like, why don't we do that? Bring back me and Renee and reboot Xena. I always hated the action, and I didn't want to live that life. But for a movie, I can do a little bit. If it's about handing over the baton to a junior Xena or whatever... If you need mine and Renee's help, let's do that. Let's talk. Which is why I think a mini series would work really well mm -hmm. because it gives more time character work, but just have it be short, limited run. It's a one and done, but it gives you more time to like have a little bit of fun with it and to relax the pacing slightly. And like this might be a controversial opinion. But I don't actually need any action in this. Oh, dang. I, I would be totally fine with a mini series of. Zena and Gabrielle just hanging out. Here's my thought on the action. For the majority of it, what action is throwing a chakram? What action yeah. is doing a neck pinch or like throwing one punch? You can get away with a lot without having a fight. And then mm -hmm. if she's up for it, and I think that should entirely be on the if, but if she is, one big action scene at the end of the final episode. Yeah. Like save it for one. Right. And then it's done and it's over. And lean heavily on stunt doubles. RJ Stewart, Steven Sears, Liz Friedman. If they'd be up for it, they were so much of the creative mind behind series one through four, Xena, which is what we really want to replicate. Michael Hurst and Renee directing, that would be so much fun. Joseph Loduca music, that OG Sun team. How cool would it be if Nyla Dixon would come back to do more costumes? Right. How do you feel about bringing back old favorites with no explanation even after they died. I don't think that death means anything in this universe. I think Joxer should just show up. Like there doesn't need to there doesn't need to be any any explanation. Nobody would expect it. <laughs> There's like in Xena, they're back. Also I'm pretty sure Kevin Smith had kids and that would be a really cute tribute. But mostly what I think we need is Carl Urban because he played like five different characters in Xena. And I think if we're truly going to honor the spirit of the original, we need him to play five different characters again. I think they should just like walk into a tavern, Carl Urban's behind the bar. You know, they walk off, they have a discussion with yeah. a warlord, like his second in command is Carl Urban. We're lost. I know we're not lost. I know exactly where we're going. You're lost. Who's the guy they ask for directions? Carl Urban. Yeah. He'd be up for it. Yeah, three to five episodes. Three to five. You know, if Lucy and Renee just want to do it super short, they could do a three episode. Yeah. It spaces it out a little bit differently than a movie does, even if it's ultimately the same length of time. And it just makes it breathe a little bit more than a movie. I, I would I would take a series of YouTube shorts. Yeah. Films <laughs> like, like on Renee's front porch with an iPhone. <laughs> like I would I I would I would take scraps. Maybe they're, they're kind of running that old tavern in Amphipolis. And I also definitely imagine them running almost like a halfway house. Yeah. That's how you pass the baton, right? Yep. Yes, 100%. And, and then every so often in this new series about this new Xena, maybe she goes like back home and it just gets advice from yeah. like Xena and Gabrielle. How great would it be to just see them as this 
comfortable married couple. Yeah, like they've been together forever. It's not a reboot. It's a spinoff like Xena was from Hercules. And much like Xena in Hercules, once in a while, she could pop up and do a cameo. Yeah. Also, I think it's really important to say, like, Xena was ahead of its time in a lot of ways. They did a lot of race-blind casting and stuff like that when a lot of other productions weren't doing it. It is the 21st century now, and there are things that we can do better. Like, better than we're done before. <laughs> there's there's really a long history of um, fantasy and sci-fi properties, especially using a lot of different cultures as sort of window dressing to look more exotic and to look and sound cooler, and then failing to uh, really reflect that in their casting choices. And I think Xena has it in itself to rise above that. And I think especially if they were passing the torch along, Lucy Lawless has stated in the past that she'd love to see a black actress play Xena. I've always thought that, you know, given that it was filmed in New Zealand and the the Maori designs of the of the breastplate were so iconic that it would be really cool to see a Maori actress play a new Xena. So I really hope that when they went into the production for something like this or or anything whether it was a continuation or a reboot, like I hope that they would have a totally open casting call, basically, when it came to ethnicity. And I feel like that's really in the spirit of the original show, which was constantly, purposely pushing boundaries in every way that it could. Uh, we solved it. They should hire us and yeah. give us millions of dollars. I mean, I have thought that for years. Yeah. But- even just giving me millions of dollars without hiring me. But. Even just hiring me without giving me millions of dollars. <laughs> and I want something that the original cast enjoys making. I know yeah. that they brought Picard back. And I got the general sense that with season three, they have so many of the original cast back. And it seems like they're really enjoying what they're doing and really finally telling the story that they wanted to tell and having a great time with it. And I feel like it's... You know, it could be... I don't think it'll happen because at the end of the day, money is what drives these decisions. It's never about the media. It's never about the fans. and It's never about the actors. It's about what it'll give. Yeah. Well... Also, I mean, just film it with your iPhone on the front porch. I don't care. We would watch it! We would watch it. I swear one of these days I will actually do a video essay about something vaguely current or you know how sometimes you have an idea for for a video and then then the idea of making it just exhausts you or you forget all of your opinions about it because too much time has passed or you don't care anymore or someone else has already done it better than you or just the idea of writing out the entire script is exhausting or you would end up going on a whole rant or it would just be you gloating for a solid hour about you know a thing that you were excited about that no one else was excited about and it turned out to be really good and you were right all along and you feel real smug about it but the the video would just be pointless it would just be you being real smug and you only make one video like every year anyways so you know why even start because you you know it's not gonna get done and and then um actually i might still do this one this one is still this one's still coming someday in like like five years maybe